Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Dr. Wang. Good morning, Jira. Dr. Wang. Norman? What does the chapter 13 homework do? Not uh, the, the homework. The homework, uh, all the homework I do technically is uh, May 8th. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so let's start it. Uh, as I said, uh, Tuesday for the final, you can just focus on the study guide. Uh, there are 30 topics on the study guide. And each topic uh, has a link to the question of those chapter practice. Uh, so nine questions come from the first exam uh, questions. Uh, then the three questions come from the chapter 13. So the final uh, scheduled on, on Canvas is May 7th uh, from 7.30 to 9.20. Okay, so if you have any question, uh, just feel free to, uh, to ask. So is Tuesday our last day, or is today our last day? Uh, today is the last day for the lecture. Uh, so yeah, this week, uh, you uh, uh, lecture will finish, and then you will finish the lab by taking the lab final. I think you did yesterday. Uh, so some people will take the lab like uh, final today, and then some people will take the lab final Friday. Uh, so then next week, uh, so all the classes, uh, lecture lab is over, just the finals next week. Okay, so I will try to finish all the greeting, greeting your labs, uh, homework, and uh, et cetera, then post it your final course grade uh, on Canvas, probably after next week sometime. All right, uh, so let's start with uh, review this question. Uh, don't click this, don't click this question because this question is, you already did uh, Tuesday. I, we are just going to review. Uh, so the answer is B. 
uh, I'm happy to say most of you, about 70% uh, of you get it right. So later on, I will post another pool question or clicker question. And then similarly, if you get it right, you will get five points. If you don't get it right, you still get two points. And that's for all the extra credit. So for this question, and let's review it and how we get this answer B. So this question has two parts. Part Y, it calculates the more fraction. Part two, it calculates molality. The given information is presented by mass of uh, NaOCl. Okay, so first, um, from the information, if you know it's 12.7% by mass of a solution, or of an equal solution, So we will start with assuming we have 100 gram of sample. Once we're assuming that, then we can take 12.7% uh, times 100 equals 12.7 gram of NaOCl. And uh, then you just do a subtraction. So 100 gram of sample minus 12.7 gram of uh, NaOCl. So we find out how much the solvent we have. The solvent is H2O. After we find out the mass of those components. So our component is NaOCl and H2O. Then we are going to use molar mass uh, of these two components to find out what are the moles of them. So molar mass of NaOCl, Na is 22.99. O is 16.00, Cl is 35.45. So that give you that give you 74.44 gram per mole. You also need the molar mass of H2O. So that equals two times because we have two hydrogen and then plus 16, there's only one oxygen. So this is the molar mass of water. Then you just to find the moles of both of them, to find more of NaOCl. We start with 12.7 gram over Y, then 74.44 gram per mole. So gram cancel out. So you get 0 0.1706, 06. Moles. And then similarly to find more of H2O, we will take the mass of H2O, which is 87.3 gram over Y, and then divided by 18.02 gram. Per one more, so you get a four point eight four five moles. 
Right. So once you get the more of two components, you can calculate the more fraction. Okay. So let's say more fraction. The question asks uh, more fraction of an AOCL. It will equals more of an AOCL divided by the more together. That equals 0 0.1706 divided by 0 0.1706 plus 4.845. Okay, so you, you divide and uh, get 0 0.034. So that's the answer for the more fraction. Next, you want to calculate so this answer for question for the, for the first part of the question. Next, you want to find the uh, uh, molality. So we'll use the definition of molality. We see that is more of an AOCL divided by kilogram of uh, solvent. So our solvent is water. So we already know the more of an AOCL. Oh, let's see, what is the kilogram of water? Well, we know the gram of water. So we have uh, 87.3 gram of uh, H2O. Let's write that over one. And then we are going to use one kg is 1,000 uh, uh, G. So therefore we get 0 0.0873 kilogram of H2O. So now we are ready to calculate this little m. So molality also called the little m. Little m equals 0 0.1706 moles over 0 0.0873 kg of H2O more of NaOCl. So get 1.95. Okay, so this is the second part of the problem. You already know the first part. So the first part answer, the first part answer is uh, 0 0.0340. So therefore these two together give you the answer B. Okay, so I think this uh, topic is also on the final study guide. So I review this. Any questions? Okay, uh, so next section, we are gonna study colligative properties. Colligative properties depend on only the quantity, not the identity of the solute particles. What do you mean by particles? The particles are maybe atoms or Molecules, 
or ions. So depend on how much of those in our solution, then some of those property of the solution or depend on how much we have. Among those common collective properties are vapor pressure lowering. So the vapor pressure of our solvent can be lowered by adding some of those non-volatile solute. And the boiling point elevation, which means the boiling point of the solution is higher than the boiling point of the pure solvent. Freezing point depression means the freezing point of the solution is lowered compared to the freezing point of the solvent. Osmotic pressure, which means the uh, solution has some of this uh, osmotic pressure or the tendency to suck in some of those small solvent. So we'll show this last topic, uh, osmotic pressure, in details later on. So first, let's take a look at the vapor pressure lowering. So this diagram shows us at the beginning, there's an equilibrium between the liquid and the vapor of this substance. So we keep this container closed, otherwise all those liquid are going to be vaporized. So if you keep this container closed, and then you see the equilibrium between the liquid and the gas. So some of those liquid vaporize to gas, and vice versa, some of those gas particles condense back into the liquid. When the equilibrium is reached, so the rate of vaporization and the rate of condensation are equal. So you have some amount, some particles of those gas exist, and most of them exist as liquid. So those blue particles are the pure solvent particles. Then we see the red particles, red circles are those non-volatile solute particles. When you add it, we add it, when you add those red to our system, and then we can see in the liquid, we have in the liquid state, we have some of those red non-volatile solute particles. We don't see those red in the gas because we are assuming they are non-volatile. Non-volatile, that means they do not vaporize so easy. So they stay in the liquid. Okay, so a couple of factors influence our, our equilibrium. One is when you add in those red particles in our liquid, the intermolecular forces, the force between the red and the blue are definitely uh, most of the time is different than the than the force between blue and the blue. Okay, so another factor is you can see on the surface once you add the red, so they exist everywhere. So some of those red at the bottom and in the middle, and some of those on the surface. So if they are on the surface, they are non-volatile. That means they do not change into gas. So they will take some portion of our area, and those area they can the blue particle can use to get into the gas. So therefore, if they take away some of those area, it kind of they take away some of those uh, open spot. They can for the blue can get into gas. It kind of they blocking the door or the window for the blue to vaporize. So therefore, after we consider these few possibilities and at a new equilibrium, we can see there's less blue particles. Less blue particle, which means the pressure 
of the wafer is lower. All right, so this is uh, the wafer pressure uh, lowering. Okay, so in the old days, and you can see some of those scientific law, it kind of uh, uh, straight and simple forward, but imagine those scientists, they don't have a computer, they don't have electricity, and how do you find out those relationship between between like the, the wafer pressure of our solvent and, and those properties looks easy, like this Routes law will give us a mathematical equation to calculate what will be the wafer pressure of our solution compared with the wafer pressure of our pure solvent. So this equation looks very simple, which tell you if you want to calculate the wafer pressure of the solution, we call that a P solution, okay? uh, E cross this X solvent, X means more fraction of the solvent. Then multiply by the pressure, by the wafer pressure of the solvent, and this zero tell you the pure solvent. So this is of the law. And uh, we're not going to see our some examples for the Routh law. I just want to you to know that uh, such a mathematical equation can calculate the partial pressure, uh, the wave pressure of our solution. Then another definition is if you can calculate the wave pressure of the solution, and then you can compare your experimental result. So if uh, if your calculation and uh, is same as your, your measurements, then you have a, a, a concept or have a definition, we call those kind of solution is the ideal solution. So very similar as we have those ideal guess. So there's a definition for the ideal solution. All right, so next we are going to study those uh, uh, boiling point elevation and freezing point depression. To do that, and let's review what we learned in chapter 11 in CAM 113, this kind of diagram or the phase diagram. So in phase diagram, you will have this Y axis, which is the pressure, and then this x axis is the temperature. So, pressure, temperature pretty much can define the phase of a substance. So, commonly the phase or state a solid, liquid, and a gas, vapor or gas. And then you can see this phase diagram show you. Uh, the, the line, so here the line is the equilibrium between solid and, and the gas. And then this line shows you the equilibrium between solid and the liquid. And this line shows you the equilibrium between liquid and the gas. All right, so we know one property of a solution is the uh, vapor pressure lowering. So let's see this three line here okay, is for pure solvent. So this three line here for pure solvent. Question? Okay, so you see like um, on the previous slide, we learned Wiffle pressure lowering. Wiffle pressure lowering. What does that mean? Dr. Wang, you cut out. Huh? Can you repeat that? You cut out. Uh, I, uh, my internet is not stable. 
You cut out a bit. What was what were you saying about vapor pressure lowering? The vapor pressure lowering is is uh, because let's go back to the slide. We see the vapor pressure lowering. Why the vapor pressure lowering? Because you if you vapor pressure lowering means you adding some of those non volatile solute. You see me? You you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. You see on the left panel we have the equilibrium for the pure solvent. Okay. So this is for pure solvent. And uh, then you add in those uh, non volatile. Non volatile are those red ones. Okay. So after you add this, you can see a couple of things happen. One is the interaction, the attraction, the attraction The attraction between the red and the blue are different than the attraction between blue and blue. So the, the red tries to hold back those blue particles. So you don't see any okay, red in, see. In, the, in the gas. You don't see the, any, any red in gas. So here, no red. Because, because those red are non volatile. What do you mean by non volatile? Not vaporized easy. So non volatile means not vaporized easy. So they pretty much stay in the liquid or, or solid. Okay, so that's one reason. The, the red one tries to hold back to the blue. Now the reason is if you add red, so the red exists everywhere, some, some of those red are on the surface. So if they are on the surface, the surface is kind of the window or the door for the blue to get out. So when you block in the door or the window, so then the, the blue have less chance to get out. So therefore, after you add in those non volatile and then you can see this, there's less blue particle in the gas. And this is the reason for the wiffle pressure lower. Right, so now let's go back to the fifth diagram. If uh, we know if we have a solution, and after we add in those non volatile solutes, so let's see this wiffle pressure for the same same temperature, so they will be lower than the initial pure, pure solvent. Okay, so this red line is the is the uh, wiffle pressure. For solution, so that makes sense now because we just learned the width of pressure of the solution. If you have a solution have some of the non volatile solute, is lower. Okay, so if uh, let's see what is the boiling point. Okay, the normal boiling point is the temperature at. Uh, uh, the temperature um, uh, at which the wiffle pressure equals the external pressure. So what is the boiling point? Boiling point, a normal boiling point means the wiffle pressure of your wiffle equals 180M. So therefore, if you draw the 180M line, so this is the pressure of the y-axis, you locate this 180M here, and then you draw to the right, you come uh, up with the intersection here for the pure solvent. Then you come up with this intersection here for the for the for the solution. So you go down and see this is the uh, as you call the time the boiling point for our solvent. Then this will be the time boiling point for T B for solution. And this is T B for solvent. So that Graphically, you can see uh, the boiling point for the solution. So here is higher because you know this is zero. Then you go to the right, the temperature increases. Yeah. So therefore, we can see a better graph is you want to find out you want to find the normal boiling point of a pure solvent. You just draw the line. Of 180m, and then you come across with this point, then you go down to get this point. So this pure solvent boiling point of this red. 
if I change the color of my plane, and uh, you, you have the same Y ATM line here, then you come across with this blue line. The blue line is the weaver pressure of the solution. You want to, you want to have, you want to boil your, your, your pressure, your weaver pressure through, through equals Y ATM. So if you, if you use this temperature here, then your solution with pressure is not Y ATM. So here, this pressure you go to the left, maybe it's 0 0.8 or something is lower than 1. So therefore, not a boil, not a boiler yet. You have to increase temperature. You increase the temperature, your weaver pressure for the solution will goes up. And that goes up, goes up until it gets to 1 ATM. So to get to my ATM with a pressure for a solution, your temperature should be here. So this will be the solution's boiling point. Then you can see temperature goes this way, increases. So that's the reason we have the, the boiling point elevation. So delta GB tell us how much temperature in Celsius or in Kelvin is, uh, Elevated because of those non volatile solutes added. So, uh, just by the phase diagram, so this phase diagram also show you this uh, comparison of these two points here. Okay, so this point, um, let me change, change the, the color. So this, I, the point I just circled uh, with the brain is the freezing point of the pure solvent. Now the one I did not circle, the red one, is the freezing point of a solution. And, and I very trivial by, by looking at the graph, you can see the freezing point of the solution gets lower. Well, the lower you can see it in many different ways, you can see that depressed. Now, how much is lower? You can see that called the delta, delta TF. Okay, so then next few slides, we are going to learn how to calculate the boiling point elevation. Okay, the so boiling point elevation here, are these two points, and here we call that delta TB. So we learn how to calculate the delta Tb, and here we will learn how to calculate delta Tf. Okay, uh, it find out uh, the change in temperature is directly proportional to molalities using the Van't Hoff factor. What that means. Well, that depends on, remember the, those property called the colligative? It depends on how much we have. So this one half factor really take care of the number of particles of a substance become when it dissolves. So in CAM 113, we learn some of those substances, when they dissolve, they when they dissolve, they separate, and some of them, they don't separate. So remember, we have those concepts called the strong electrolyte, weak electrolyte, and non-electrolyte. So we have a strong and a weak and non-electrolyte. So electrolyte, which means they can and dissociate or separate into ions. Okay, uh, so that's a quick review. For example, uh, if you have this CaCl2, which is the calcium chloride, is soluble. Okay, so this soluble in water. So ideally, uh, so when you put a CaCl2, when you put a CaCl2 in water, and uh, you don't have CaCl2 together anymore, 
what you have, so if you put this in water, they become aqueous. You only have ions and ions. So by say there's one Ca, so they have one Ca. There are two of Cl, so they have two Cl. Okay. So that means if you take one Ca Cl2, negative you get a one plus two, so one plus two equals three ions. So this will be our expected, or ideally, the went half factor. So if you know you have a strong electrolyte and you can predict or expect what will be the white half factor. So where it's kind of simple, you just read the formula if you have CuCl2, which means you can to the most produce three ion. So therefore we have one calcium ion plus two chloride ion. So one plus two is three, three ion. So therefore our expected a half of my factor will be three. Which means when you take one unit of CCL2, actually you get a three particles in the solution. Okay, so any question about that? Okay, then we know why for uh, HCL the I, uh, so uh, the, the, the idea of I is two. So similar, if you have a CA uh, a, uh, HCl, so that is a strong acid. So strong acid, as we know, it just become uh, hundred percent become uh, uh, dissociate, ionized. So you you have one. A plus aqueous. Then you have one Cl, uh, one negative aqueous. So you can think about it also you have this uh, coefficient. So there's one HCl, uh, one H plus, and one Cl one negative. So therefore you have one plus one equals two. So therefore our expected one half factor. So I were equals two. Okay, what about for those non electrolyte? For non electrolyte. For example, medicinal. Or uh, glucose. C6H12, H6O6. So for, for those non electrolyte, they all have I equals one because they don't dissociate or ionize. You put one medicinal in water, you have one particle or one molecular of medicinal. All right, so once we know that, and uh, we can say, uh, we can use these two formula, calculate what will be the boiling point of our solution. If we know the boiling point of our solvent, if we know the I and the KB and F. Okay, so usually this will be the question. Well, to do that, obviously you have to know how to calculate this little m. So this little m, this little m is more likely to. So the beginning of the class, when we review the critical question, we know how to calculate molality. And then in the, with the last slide, just know, or this slide, we just know how to find out the I. For strong electrolyte, we can use the expected, like I equal to two for HCl, I equal to three for CCl2, I equal to one for medicinal. Then we use the bottom equation to calculate the freedom point for the solution. So you will know that another constant, the so-called Kf and Kb, so those are very well, well known quantity. You can use tables to get those numbers. 
Okay, so for example, for this one, for this question, you want to calculate uh, the freezing point of a solution that has this much, uh, uh, this much uh, CHCl3, and then this much of oh, this guy. Okay, uh, so this this kind of this will our now volatile solute, okay, uh, which is non electrolyte. So that means your one to half factor I equals one. Okay. So then this CHCl3 is our solvent. All right, so then you just want to calculate uh, your freezing, po uh, freezing point for your, for your solution. So we'll write the formula, so we say TF, solution minus TF solvent equals negative I KF little m. Okay. And um, so as we said, uh, we want to find out this question mark. We shall look at the table, see what is this. So let's write TF our solution minus what's the TF for CHCL, uh, the normal uh, freezing point is here. So negative 63 on the five degrees Celsius, then we see I is one. Okay, see so here I put one, so therefore one here. So then next, you know, what is the KF? So KF is this color. So KF for CHCl3 is 4.68. And then you need to find out the number for the little m and put it here. You solve this equation for TF solution. Okay, so to find out the little m will be the step now to solve this problem, right? Uh, so to do that, obviously, to find the m of our C10 H. 18 O, we need molar mass of uh, C10 H18 O. So next slide, we are going to do that and find the little m and put it here. Okay, so first let's see what is the molar mass of uh, C ten H eighteen O. So you see there are ten carbon, so ten times twelve point oh one. So twelve point oh one from the periodic table. Then we have eighteen H uh, for one H is one point oh one. Then we have one O, so sixteen point zero zero. You multiply and add one five four point two eight gram or more. Okay, so I tell you, you have 42.0 gram of C10H18O. Uh, Just write that over one. And then we have one by 4.28 gram per mole, so this is from molar mass. Gram, gram cancel out. And we get 0 0.2722 moles. The question tell you we have 0 0.600 kg of CHCl3. I put in the parentheses, so this is our solvent. So now I'll calculate the little m in the trivial. You just take 0 0.2722 divided by 0 0.600. So 0 0.454. Later on, okay. Now we just we are ready to put this back into our solution on last slide. So to do that, we'll do it here. So TF 
of a solution I use abbreviation so S O L N for solution minus negative sixty three point five degrees Celsius equals negative one so this one is our one to half factor i and then k f uh, k f is constant four point six eight degrees Celsius over little m we just find our little m is zero point four by four, that's okay. yeah. So how did you get one though? Because you said it, uh, for the i value, that's all I'm confused about. I can understand everything else. Okay. You said so, non-validate. Yeah, non non-validator and non light i equal to one. Oh. Okay. Yeah. So. Well, and we yeah. can tell it's non-volatile because. Yeah, non-volatile not that important. Uh, uh, so i equal to one because it's c ten h a t o is uh yeah so non electrolyte which means they don't uh, break apart. So they stuck together as one unit. Okay, that's what I was wondering. Yeah. Thank you. Welcome. Okay, so good question. Now what do you do? Just solve this. And you can see this uh, if you if you subtracting and adding so TF solution equals negative sixty three point five degrees Celsius, then this few numbers together, the M M comes out uh, negative two point one two Celsius. So all together we get negative sixty five point six two Celsius. So that's our answer. Okay, any other questions or comments? Yeah, so gotta be careful with the, the, the I on the one to half factor. Okay, so this question, you can do the calculation, or you, just, you can just compare. Okay, uh, which one will have the lowest freezing point? So the formula to calculate the freezing point that we saw on the last question, the TF for the solution minus TF for the solvent, the pure solvent equals negative I KF and little m. Uh, so now, if our solution is aqueous, so that means uh, water is solvent. So then we know what is our normal freezing point for water? Zero, right? So therefore, this equation becomes TF solution equals negative i kf times little m okay so they all have the same kf if you go to the table you see the kf for water is 1.86 then you multiply by i times m okay so now let's make a list of this i times m. So what is i times m for all for all of those given? For a, we have 0 0.050 little m CaCl2. Okay. So what is the expected i for CaCl2? Let me make another column probably. Uh, 
this i first, then i times, then i times n. This i, then i times n. So this is three, right? As we saw on the last, on the first slide. So then three times this to get 0 0.15. So for second one, the we have 0 0.15 molality of NACF. So what is the what is the I for NACF? Okay, so what do you think? What is the I for NACF? Two. Yeah, who said two? 0 0.10 ACL. Yeah, perfect. So this is two. Because you have two ion yeah. for each one NACL give you one NA plus ion, one CL, one negative ion. So therefore, all together, I equal to two. So two times upon one five to get that, right? So what is I for HCL? Two. Any, anyone know? Okay, two. I oh, two. it's two. Yeah, two. So therefore, zero point two zero. Okay. Uh, so now this one kind of lengthy. Anyone know the name for this C three C O O H? So what 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 is? Hi. No, 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 no. What 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 is C three? You can find this in your teaching. Acetic acid? Yeah, acetic acid. It's, it's a vinegar. It's a weak acid. Right? It, it dissociates somehow. It will give you some of those H. Uh, give you the acetate. So C3, C3, COO, and But not 100%. Okay? So, therefore, what do you think of the, the I? For this acetic acid, give me the range. You, you don't have a number because it's a weak acid. Or it will be more than what, or less than what? More than one or two. <laughs> Good. So I, more than one, but less than two. Okay. If you even take the, the maximum two, so you get zero point one zero. Okay. Okay, so the last one has squeezed in here. So we have E, which is looks like uh, sucrose, point two zero molar, um, no, molar molarity, C twelve H twenty two O eleven. What do you think? Uh, so let me write here. So this is C twelve H twenty two O eleven. Let's say is our table sugar. Do you think a table sugar you put in water will give you some give you some iron? No. Right? So this is definitely is non electrolyte. Non electrolyte. So I is one. Okay? Therefore, you have this one times one, you still have this, this. Okay? See here the equation? We see our TF solution will equal this number. Okay? So how much negative your, your, your freezing point of solution, they all have negative 1.86 times the I, I F. So what do you think? Which one will have the lowest or the most negative TF solution? It depends on the number of I times M. So which of those subtens has the largest? If if see the largest one is point three here. So if you take a point three here and multiply, you will get some number. So that will be the most negative. So the answer is this, right? Uh, Dr. Wei, mm -hmm. for, uh, for D, uh, 
acetic acid, why is it DIM.10? Why do we choose the uh, I being two? For C, <laughs> because we want to, because uh, you want to have the, you want to, you want to choose the largest I times N. Okay. Oh, so, okay. Yeah. yeah. So if you take a two, it's still less than the point of three. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. What if it was instead of negative one point six? What if it was positive one point eight six? Would we flip it? Would we want the lowest number? Uh, good question. Uh, if you will get a positive number like for the boiling point elevation, then you will see who has the highest boiling point. Got it. Okay, any other questions? All right, uh, so as I said, uh, this osmosis or osmotic pressure is easier to understand with those diagrams. So we know some of those substances, for example, the cell membrane in, in, in like a living organism. So they can block some of those uh, large particles and allow a small particle to go in through. So here, you see, there's a semi permeable membrane. So, in this picture, um, you can see this blocker here, it block the movement of those severe blue particles. So, blue particles cannot pass in through this barrier here. But the red particle, like water, can pass in through. Okay? So, then you can see. Actually, at the beginning, we have this uh, tube. In this tube, we separate the left arm with the right arm by this semi permeable membrane. And if on the left, we have pure water, on the right, we have a solution. And if you have this kind of setup, you see what happens is your left side volume gets less and less, and your right side getting more and more. What happened? What happened, we know, is the water from the left side migrate to the right side. Okay? So then if you apply pressure, you can apply a, a stopper or piston to push on the right side, then you can stop that. So then how much pressure do you need to stop the increase of the volume on the right side and that pressure, you call that pressure, is osmotic pressure. Okay, so the net movement of solvent molecule from a solution of a low to high concentration of a solute across the same mitochondrial membrane is osmosis. The applied pressure to solve it is osmotic pressure, uh, give it a fancy name, and this capital letter pi. So it's this equation. And uh, don't worry too much about this equation. This equation is very similar as our equation you're familiar with, the ideal gas law. Remember the ideal gas law, PV equals NRT. You rearrange, so you get P equals N over V times RT, okay? So what is N over V? This is the molarity. A molarity. Okay, so this are molarity. All right, so then you, you, you for this property, because depending on how much particle we have, usually this M for the given formula, so therefore you will use this one half of factor I. All right, I think this is the last question for this uh, uh, for this chapter. It's very interesting. Uh, so it's about the protein. So protein, uh, obviously, is the polymer of those uh, 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 amino acid, right? And so protein usually have a very long uh, long chain, uh, but but they are not even Stop there, so they become they produce so called complexes. So maybe two, three, four uh, individual protein, we call them monomers. 
we put in the quotation mark because protein already a polymer of monomer, so therefore we, we call a protein the monomer it's kind of not exact. So those protein interacting together produce a complex, and the complex can act as one particle in the solution. And that will cause those weaver pressure lowering, freezing point depression, bottom point elevation, and osmotic pressures. So in one research, you find out you have a protein. You have a protein, let's say one protein. So this monomer, which means one protein. Uh, uh, the one protein, maybe called a chain. Okay. Then that one protein chain, sometimes they coagulate together, produce a complex. Okay. So you measure, you, let's say, or someone tell you, if you produce that protein, your protein will have a more mass like that. Okay. But then you measure the uh, osmotic pressure of your protein, and if you get this much ATM, and then temperature set this temperature, then how much protein you use, you use that much protein. In what solution, you, you have like a 10 ml solution. So then from this information, you want to find out how many protein monomer or how many protein chain in this in this 7.2 gram of those protein. Are they really exist as like one protein chain, one protein chain, or like two protein chain together, or three or four protein chain together as one particle? To solve this problem, you just using the equation. Uh, so we see that equation, the osmotic pressure pi equals I times uh, M times uh, R times T. Okay. Uh, what do you think uh, those numbers give you? If we think a protein is non wallet a uh, non electrolyte, so they tell you I equals what? And then what is our given information for pi? What is R? What is T? What is M? So M will be the last question mark you want to find out from this equation. Okay, so I equals one. Do you agree? Okay. So pi is the pressure in ATM. So that is given 0 0.0916 ATM. What is R? Guess about constant, your old friend. So 0 0.08206. What is T? Temperature in Kelvin. So give you 37, you have to change into Kelvin. So this is the question mark we don't know. Okay? So now you plug everything in. So you have 0 0.0916 ATM equals I is one. This M, uh, this M you don't know. And then you see this R is 0 0.08206 ATM times L, our typical unit, and then more times Kelvin. Uh, okay, so. What do we get? If I add in 37 here, so 0, 1, and 1, and 3, right? So that's just so 3, 1, 10 Kelvin. Okay, so Kelvin, Kelvin kind of out. And uh, that ATM here, this ATM kind of out. Okay, so we're ready to do the calculation for our capital M. So you take a 0. Point Nine one six divided by. Uh, let me go to the next slide. So we will take a zero point nine one six divided by zero point zero eighty two zero six. Uh, so for all, all kinds of hours, you just have these two units left over from the R, and then you have this seven ten. Don't have a unit anymore. So that's our capital F. Okay, so after you do a calculation, you find out capital M is 0 0.0365 more over liters. Uh, given your total volume, so given 10, so given 10.00 meter liter, you do a conversion, let's say 1,000 meter liter, one liter, to get 0 0.01000 liter. 
So they are ready. So it has 0 0.0100 liter over one, and then the given concentration is one L 0 0.0365 moles. Therefore, you find out how much how much moles of your protein. So that is 3.65 your scientific notation, negative four moles. Okay, so then last is what is the molar mass in the gram or moles, right? So give you 7.2 gram. Then divided by this 3.65 times 10 to negative 4 moles, so you get 197260 gram per mole. So this is the mass of our complex. So what is the molar mass of one protein? Molar mass of one protein is given in the problem. It's 25,000. Okay. So what do you do? You will take 197260 divided by 25,000. That give you 7.9 drawn into 8. That means in our protein complex, it has 8 protein. Okay, so this is a very important question. I will I will put on the uh, practice on the study guide for the final. All right, any questions? Okay, uh, if you don't have a question or you have some question, you can ask me later in the office hour. So office hour, let's start like after 11. And uh, next, you will see the, those concept for the, we call them uh, isotonic, which means the same osmotic pressure. Same acid pressure means you have the same uh, solute concentration. Uh, so hypotonic, uh, which means lower osmotic pressure, the solvent will leave the solution at a higher rate than it enters. Uh, so solute concentration is low. Hypotonic solution, high osmotic pressure, so the solvent will enter the solution at a higher rate than it leaves, which means the solute concentration is higher. Biologically, it's very important. And uh, for example, you see this uh, red blood cell. If the red blood cell is in the isotonic medium, so neither swell nor shrink. So this is the left panel. Uh, the, the middle panel is a crenation, which means it's a shrink. <laughs> so what happens is uh, red blood cell is placed in a, in a hypertonic environment which means uh, solute concentration in those blue area is high, so they suck out the water from the from the cell. Obviously, if you put uh, the red blood cell in the environment that is uh, 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 so hypotonic, which means the solute here concentration is lower, so then what happens? The water migrate into the cell, the cell will burst. Uh, so that's our last slide before this critical question. Uh, so this critical question is open. Uh, just make sure you get an answer right. If you get an answer right, you will get five points. Wrong answers, two points.
a little, little hint. See, the process we did on the last program is you find out, let's say, from the given pressure, that where is the partial pressure here? Okay. So from that 0 0.0458, you get the molarity, and then you get the moles, then you get the molar mass, then you get number of uh, proteins. 